Hello mates, what's up? In this video, I'm going to be building the 135th T34E by Border Model. This was a great build and it did have plenty of ups, but it also came with some serious downs. Before we get stuck in, let's take a look inside the box. So Border decided to supply this kit in a nice wooden box. The kit parts are well molded and there's some great slide molding detail. Coupled with the usual fantastic rivet detail and fine panel lines, this is looking to be a great kit. The cast texture on the turret sides was a nice inclusion, but it looks a bit uniform for my taste. The tracks are nicely detailed, and they also come with tiny casting numbers. They're also supposed to be workable. One thing I really like is that Border have supplied a turned aluminium barrel. The instructions are nicely printed and really easy to follow. You also get given a correction sheet. Both of the border kits I've had have had correction sheets. You'd like to think they'd spend the time checking it before they release it. You also get several paint schemes, all in Russian 4BO green. So, let's get building. The parts were removed carefully from the sprues with my god hand side cutters. Any unwanted flash or seam lines were carefully scraped with a scalpel and then sanded flush with my Infini model 800 grit sanding stick. The construction, as you'd expect, started with the lower hull tub. Once the parts had been cleaned up, they were fixed in place with VMS Starian Cement fast setting. Following in Tamiya's footsteps, Border have decided to employ polycaps for the running gear. This makes painting a whole lot simpler later on. Border decided to make the suspension on this kit workable. It's a nice feature, but the problem is Border use a very soft plastic, which means things might just get broken. Let's hope not. Some of the locating pins on the suspension arms snapped off during transit, so I had to fix them by drilling them out and inserting some 0.5mm stiff wire. The wire was glued in place with VMS 5K Flexi Super Glue for Photo Etch. I just hope my budget fix holds up. The detailing with the lightning holes on the tyres is just fantastic. Combined with that chunky hubcap, these wheels look like they mean business. I just love polycaps. I can put the wheels on now and take them off for painting. Perfect. I annealed the rear photo etch grill with a lighter to make bending it easier. After a few seconds, it was bent into shape. Unfortunately, I don't have a dedicated tool yet, so I just had to wing it.
as there was a slight warp with my frontal armour plate, I had to tape it in place whilst the glue was drying to make sure it set right. Before I glued the grills in place, I had to paint underneath them to make sure you couldn't see any grey plastic. With hindsight, I could have painted this just black, but I want to do things properly. I used a mix of AK Real Colour 4BO mixed 50-50 with their protective K green. I think the AK Real Colour 4BO out of the bottle looks dull, so I added the protective K to give it a bit more life and a bit more vibrancy. The extra armour for the hull sides had loads of ejector pin marks, but you won't see them, so I left them as they are. At this stage, I left the hull armour unglued. Leaving them off means I don't have to perform any airbrush gymnastics, and it makes painting much easier. The mounting hooks for the tow cables were moulded on plastic U's. The other option was the kit photo etch. And neither looked any good, so I made my own out of 0.5mm wire. The kit is advertised as having a full turret interior. Now it's got a gun breech, breech block, all the gunny things, but that's about it. There aren't any fixtures or fittings around the side of the turret, the back of the turret. It's not really a full turret interior, is it, Border? Now coming up is the extra armour for the turret. This was a problematic assembly. The parts didn't fit properly and it didn't help that the instructions were completely incorrect. And funnily enough, that includes some corrections we saw on the correction sheet supplied with the instructions. And while you might be right in saying that, hey, it's modelling, fixing it is part of the fun. For a kit that was released fairly recently, this isn't on. Border instruct you to drill out some mounting holes for the extra armour supports. Don't bother, these did not line up with the kit parts. And also, the mounting arms are not numbered correctly. I found the best way of dealing with this to trim them all off the sprues and test fit until I was happy that they were correct. I filled in my drilled out holes with milliput. This is a great putty and has a very long working time, a few hours so you've got plenty of time to make sure you get it right. It also cleans up nicely with water, which you can use to smooth out the finish or blend it in. When the milliput had dried, I re-added some of the lost cast texture with Mr. Surfacer 1000. This was stippled on with an old stiff brush. So, let's build up one side of the turret armour. First up, all of the parts were removed from the sprues and the locator pins cut away. All of the support bars were attached to the turret at different angles, so you need to make sure each bar lines up flush with the turret and flush with the armour. For the centre section, the two beams face inwards towards the vision slot. For the outer section, the beams face away and towards the front and rear of the tank. And they should look a little something like this. And if it wasn't for the encouragement of my patrons, I don't think I'd have a T-34 with turret armour. They encouraged me to fix the problem, and I'm glad I did. Thanks guys. As you can imagine, I don't usually lose patience with a kit, but 
this one nearly got me. But anyway, onwards and upwards. The turret armour was glued onto the sides of the turret. This was held in place with tape whilst it was drying as there were no locator pins. The fit of the mantlet and barrel was really good, I didn't use any glue here. As I said before, the tracks are nicely detailed and they click together really easily. I did, however, run into a few problems when attaching them to the tank. I think workable was a bit of an overstatement. I'm going to get some Master Club tracks. I'm sure they'd be fine with a bit of glue though, so don't despair. Anyway, whilst I'm waiting for those Master Club tracks to arrive, let's get painting. The whole model was given a layer of Mr. Surfacer 1500, just to unify the photo etch parts. It was then sort of reprimed with MRP Black Fine Surface Primer. This will give me a nice smooth black surface on which to do my black basing. For the main colour, as I said earlier, I'm using AK Real Colour 4BO mixed one to one with Protective K Green. This was thinned with 70% Mr. Leveling Thinner. I'm also trying out a 0.15 nozzle and needle combination on my Hardin Steam Back. I love black basing, it's got to be one of my favourite techniques for getting a load of tonal variation on that first base colour. It works by building the paint up in transparent mottly layers. You can get some really nice artificial shading by reducing the amount of paint you put down. And the more paint and opacity you build up gives you a slightly highlighted effect, meaning you can achieve highlights and shadows in just the one layer. I like to spray this really close to the model, about one centimeter. This is built up with loads of small mottles and shapes and gives you loads of tonal variation along with the highlights and shadows. Once I've achieved a good range of light and shadow, I go over the base coat with several light passes of the base colour just to blend the effect in. If you're often painting vehicles, a circle template is an essential addition to your arsenal. They're really handy, and even if it doesn't have the size you need exactly, you can usually get close enough. To add some more interest to the green base coat, I decided to add some more highlights. I added a few drops of MRP Dunkel Garb and Insignia Yellow to my previous mix of 4BO and Protective K. This was applied along the sides of panels just to separate them a bit and add some more visual interest. It was also sprayed on some of the raised areas of the tank to make them pop. Next up was the chipping. I mixed up a lightened version of the base coat with Vallejo German Yellow, Olive Green and Russian Uniform World War II. This was applied with a stiff sponge.
I also added some scratches and scuffs with the same mix with a 2-0 Kalinsky Sable brush. I infilled some of the scratches and scuffs with VMS Chip and Nick CN01. This is an almost rusty dark brown colour and it's great for filling in chips and adding some more depth. Remember when chipping with a brush to paint lots of tiny chips instead of big ones. It can be tricky to make such fine marks with a brush, but I find that making sure you've got a top quality brush makes this a lot easier. I did try this numerous times with cheaper brushes, but they just don't quite perform. So I always use a 2-0 Kalinsky Sable. Also, with a technique like this, practice is key. So don't worry if your chips don't turn out great first time. Just keep practicing and you'll get there in the end. As you probably noticed from the opening images, I'm going to be doing a winter whitewash. But before I get stuck in with that, I need to protect all my previous layers. I sprayed on two light coats of VMS Matte Varnish HD. Not only is this tough, but it's also dead flat. Once this had dried, I followed up with two heavy coats of AK Heavy Chipping Fluid. I'm going to be using several layers separated by chipping fluid. The paint I'm using is MRP White mixed with Clear Dope Linen V1. This has been thinned about 50% with Mr. Leveling Thinner. For the first layer of whitewash, I'm lightly blocking in the camouflage colours. Because I'm using lacquers, I need to make sure my layers are really thin, otherwise they'll be a bit trickier to chip. Most people like to use acrylic for this step, but I guess I like making life difficult for myself. The reason I'm using several layers for this process is I really want this whitewash to look field applied and chipping through several layers of white will give you a much more varied finish than just one solid coat. Once the first whitewash layer had dried, which didn't take very long, I used warm water and a stiff brush to chip away a lot of the paint. As this layer was mainly sketching out the camo, it didn't matter how much I wore away. So let's call this an initial texture layer. With the texture layer complete, I varnished it to seal it in with VMS Matte Varnish HD, and then reapplied the AK chipping fluid and started again with a body colour. This layer will be the main airbrushed whitewash layer, so I went a bit heavier with it, just to block in some more of the white. This layer was then chipped in the same way as the previous one. This way, we're going to get loads of nice variation. Once the excess water had dried, it was time to lay down some more varnish and chipping fluid for the final layer. And this is where things are gonna start getting a bit more interesting. We're going to be applying the same lacquer mix, but this time with a paintbrush. After seeing this crosshatch camo scheme on some T34 reference images, I really wanted to try it on this build. Now the T34E was in service for a few months in 1943, and I'm not aware of any examples of the T34E that actually served during the winter. Theoretically, this is kind of a what if paint scheme, but only by a few months. Anyway, back to the painting. Brush painting lacquers can be quite a daunting prospect, but as long as you don't overload your paintbrush, you'll be okay. 
Problems can start when you lay down too much paint in one go. More paint means more thinner, and lack of thinner over other paints doesn't work too well, so you want to be light and controlled with your application, otherwise you might melt any previous layers. It's at this point things start to look a bit more messy. I'm brushing on the lacquers in a random manner over the previous whitewash layers. This will give the impression of a field applied painted camouflage. Both the crosshatch and the painted camo were then chipped away with some warm water. I had to be careful not to remove too much of the crosshatch pattern with my chipping, so I approached this step with a bit more restraint than the previous ones. It was at this point my Master Club tracks arrived. These are really nicely cast with some great detail. There are a few casting nubs to clean up, but this won't be too much work. These tracks also come with two tiny resin pins that are either pushed or glued into place. The casting nubs were sanded off with an emery board or nail file. I tend to use the finer grip for this because the coarse grade can scratch the metal a bit too much. Once the tracks were clean, they were ready to assemble. So what you do is click the track links together. Once they're in place, slot in one of the pins. This might take a bit of the fiddling and occasionally you'll find one track hole that needs opening up with a drill bit. But overall the process is pretty painless. Once the tracks were assembled, they were given a light burnish with VMS Black Track Pro. Before I put the tracks on the tank, it was time to dirty them up a bit further. They were given a speckle of MIG Tracks Wash and MIG Light Rust Wash. The worn inner sections of the tracks were then sanded with an Infini Model 1000 grit sanding sponge cut to size and dragged along the surface. The tracks were then put into place. It was a bit of a struggle, but it was alright in the end. It was time to add some more depth to the model with a pin wash. I used a mix of burnt umber and French ultramarine artist oils thinned with VMS Universal Weathering Carrier. This was then applied around all the raised rivet detail and in any panel lines. To add some more artificial shading, I used this same mix and brushed it along the edges of select panel lines. This was then blended in with a dry, soft brush. To break up the finish further and add some more visual interest, I added some grime streaks with oil brusher grime. This was blended in with a soft wide brush. And being a winter vehicle, 
I wanted to add some more prominent rust streaks than I usually would. For this, I used both MIG Streaking Rust and Light Rust Wash. These were brushed carefully into place. When they had dried for a bit, they were blended in with VMS Universal Weathering Carrier and downward streaking motions. Before I attached the side skirts, I wanted to muddy up the road wheels. As most of this won't be seen, I wasn't too careful. I mixed some coarse VMS pigment with some enamel products and brushed this liberally over the road wheels. The side skirts were then glued in place with VMS super glue. In hindsight, I should have scraped the attachment points and used plastic cement. I was just being a bit lazy. Now this wouldn't be a winter tank without some heavy mud. I decided to use some coarse VMS pigments, EU Dark Earth and EU Brown Earth, mixed with their acrylic structuring resin. These coarse pigments are great because they can give you lots of texture with very little effort. Before I applied the heavier mud, I decided to speckle this mixture on to give myself some nice splatters and an outline as to where my heavier mud would go. For the heavier areas of mud, I added a bit more pigment to the mix and brushed this in place. Once I was happy with the volume, I speckled a layer over the top to add some more texture. For the final step of the mud, I wanted to add some really nice, dark, glossy effects. I mixed up some Abtalung 502 Sepia, which is a nice dark brown, with some Humbral Gloss Enamel Varnish. This was slightly thinned with VMS Universal Weathering Carrier, and brushed in all the areas where I wanted wet effects. To represent a nice, well-used engine deck, I speckled on some Abtalung 502 engine grease. It's a lovely, mucky, diesely brown, and it also dries glossy, which is really useful. I also used the Abtalung 502 engine grease for some more dramatic oil spills and stains on the engine deck. For the final touch, I wanted to add a little bit of stowage to make the tank look a bit more lived in. I glued on some spare tracks with PVA glue and also added some German jerry cans tied to the handrails with 0.2 plus models lead wire.
And with that, the build was complete. Before we got into the gallery images, I've got two things I'd like to say. The first one is I've just launched a Discord server. So if you want a place to talk about models, share your work, get critique, the link's in the description. It'd be great to see you there. And secondly, I'd like to give a huge thanks to my patrons. Your support helps keep the channel running. If you're interested in becoming a patron and enjoying exclusive photos, polls and more, then head over to patreon.com forward slash LPJ models or click the link in the description or in the card above. I'm James from LPJ Models. Thanks for watching.